Hello everyone and uh, welcome to today's Human Factor Forum. I'm amazed to see, you know, that uh, we got this attendees today and I want to pass you a big thanks uh, to you all and of course to Step Change in Safety and uh, the Energy Institute for supporting this event. And at last uh, to Caroline Smith, our program delivery manager that pulls the string uh, behind the scene. And by the way, uh, my name is uh, Lamberto Nonno, Global HSME Leader at Begeriugs and uh, proudly serving as one of the chairs of the Human Factor Workgroup at Step Change in Safety, together with uh, Steve Murphy, Senior HSME Advisor at TACA. Now, let's have a look to the agenda. And uh, before I forget, there won't be any need to take pictures or screenshot or record the presentation uh, given during the forum. The forum is being recorded by Caroline and will be made available after the event. So please know that there is a Q&A feature on the side of your window where you can type your question for our speaker. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce someone that actually doesn't really need an introduction. Someone that began working offshore in the early 80s and that was, that was on board the Piper Alpha in the 88 and someone that made his duty to ensure that the legacy of the disaster continued to push the oil and gas industry, reflecting what else can be done to improve and make itself easier. Steve Ray, Executive Director of uh, Step Change in Safety. Steve. Thank Thank you, Lamberto. Thank you for your very kind introduction, and uh, I appreciate you mentioning uh, Piper Alpha. It's what uh, drives us all, and it should continue to drive us all as we consider safety offshore. Uh, I'm delighted to be opening this event on behalf of Step Change and Safety, in particular the Human Factors Group. Uh, Step Change and Safety events such as the one that you are attending today have a common purpose, which is to influence and improve safety in our industry through engagement, leadership, and collaboration. This event is a true demonstration of engagement and collaboration as we are supported by the Energy Institute. And we also have three excellent presenters from IOGP, Heli Offshore and the highly regarded human factor specialist, Green Street Berman. More about them later from Lamberto. Our presenters will share their thoughts on the challenges we have all encountered during the past 14 months of this pandemic, during which they may make reference to the much talked about new normal. However, I would challenge that we have some ways to go before we truly understand what the new normal may actually look like from a human factors perspective. Today is all about sharing and learning from our collective experiences, in particular in the area of human performance, with a common purpose and shared desire of creating our industry's safe new normal. We must do so while reminding ourselves that we operate in high hazard working environments where keeping our people and assets safe must continue to be our number one priority. So we take the time to plan ahead for our safe new normal. We must also ensure we take time to consider the impact that any proposed changes may have on our established routines and practices. As a member led organisation, Step Change and Safety relies on the continued support of all its stakeholders, particularly during these challenging times. So it pleases me to see that our membership count remains strong, our work groups fully subscribed and our forums such as this one well attended, with over 200 interested parties signing up for today's event. Which brings me to a quote by Margaret Mead, the American anthropologist best known for commenting on a wide array of societal issues, such as environmental pollution, women's rights and race relations. In today's modern world, these topics form part of our climate change and diversity and inclusion agendas. In Margaret's words, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has changed the world. With such a large attendance at today's Human Factors Forum, I assume we can expect some world changing discussions. I encourage you all to get your virtual yellow hands raised to share your own thoughts and ideas for providing constructive feedback during today's event. I'll close by reminding you that the success of this event is in your own hands. Have a great day and now back to your host Lamberto. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Steve. Yeah, you know, I'm very excited as well for this forum today. Imagine 30 years 
from now, I'll be able to say to my nephew, I was there. When, when we started rebuilding the world after the pandemic, when we looked at how to resume to full operational capacity in the oil and gas, I was there. We were all on a forum discussing how Pivotal would have been managing properly human factor. And with us here today, we got the best panel ever. And I'll start with one of the truly holistic experts in health and safety in the energy sector. And when I say holistic, it's because his international career has spanned in wealth engineering and operation around the world with all the HSE challenge that came with them, holding industry board or leadership appointment with entities like the International Well Control Forum, uh, DOG UK, and various committee of uh, this SPE and IADC. And he currently also uh, chairs a joint industry project 37 pertaining to helicopter safety, serves as a board member of the Well Control Institute, a contributing steering role for initiative like human performance, oil and gas, and various others. And in 2018, he was appointed visiting professor with Robert Gordon University. And right just before the pandemic, it was seconded from Shell to IOGP. Olaf Skar, Director of Health, Safety and Security and Wells at the International Association of Oil Gas Producer. Hi, Olaf. Nice to see you here. And then, then we have a mastermind in the field of human factors and safety culture. You know, a few months ago, I was talking about the forum with the Energy Institute about uh, what also the challenge that we should prepare uh, for, you know, post pandemic, of course. And his uh, name and the guidance he has written for the Energy Institute came out. And in fact, he is lead author of the guide Managing Major Accident Hazard Risk During Organizational Change, where he covered identification and management of uh, all the latent human factor risk uh, associated with organizational change and has provided review and advice on a wide range of changes and on only in the oil and gas industry. And that's Michael Wright, director at Greenstream Berman. Hi, Michael, nice to see you here. And, uh, you know, while Olaf and uh, Michael can give us their helicopter view on what we should be expecting soon, I'm really wondering what a helicopter pilot would tell us on human factor. You know, today we have the CEO of Valley Offshore with us a veteran of the industry that on top of having accumulated 8,500 rotary flying hours, he held a number of leadership positions in operation, training and safety at Bristol, right? And Tim Roth, Chief Executive Officer at Ali Offshore. Hi, Tim. Nice to see you all here. Now, uh, let me take a moment uh, to remind all the attendees that we have a Q&A feature uh, button over there on your side and you can use it uh, to post your question. So make sure that you get comfortable with the feature and pose also, you know, questions, but also upvote, you know, like all those questions uh, that you want to be answered. Our fantastic panelists will answer as many as questions as possible. So uh, I'd like to start with Olaf and uh, hear from his global IOGP view if the industry has, share vision, has a shared vision to the challenge ahead and how we can collaborate further. Olaf, the virtual floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Lambato. I'm uh, obviously delighted to be here and, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, yeah, my mother couldn't have done it better. Um, I believe that, uh, that our current drive to better embed human performance or human factor principles in our industry is, is the next key step for, for both efficiency and safe outcomes. Uh, we've got many challenges ahead. And, and we need to get better at, at human performance, human factors to solve them. I believe it will make us better as individuals, as teams and as companies. And it will set us up for the energy transitions ahead. My hope is that it will also help change perceptions around our industry. In my book, we are a force for good in society. I'm proud of what we contribute and I want to shout it from the rooftops. Now, for today's input, uh, I decided to, to lean on some personal experience um, as I try and paint the picture of where I would like to be. Uh, my background is in Wales, uh, where I have been privileged to contribute in many areas across the world. And I wanted to highlight a particular example depicted on the image that you can see behind me. It was a place of, of respect and care. On this rig, everyone contributed to the safety program. In fact, if you did not, you would be hauled out of bed in order to make a daily contribution, either positively recognizing someone or to highlight any areas for improvement. This is how we did things around there. 
those who could not read or write English sought the help of a colleague to help them get their improvement ideas logged for the benefit of all. We read them with curiosity and acted when needed. We harvested, implemented and recognized good ideas from anyone, both tangibly and through applause from colleagues. If your mattress was not great, we would immediately send somebody from the office to buy a new one. It would be on the next boat. If the bags of rice or barite were heavy, we got lighter ones, recognizing that much of the materials and published guidelines are based on European or American sized workers. We celebrated every national day in our diverse team. I still recall an amazing buffet with smoked salmon, cake in national colors, flags, and unbelievably crowned by a plastic moose's head when I happened to visit on the Norwegian National Day, the 17th of May. Our daily menu had calorie count next to every meal listed on the chef's, chef's whiteboard, and the menu covered all preferences from east to west. When signals of concern arose in our morning call, we grabbed our coverall hanging in the office, called the chopper and headed straight out to the rig to do our bit to help, to find out what we or I could have done better to prevent. When our onshore logistics uh, team were pleased with the rig interaction or somebody had raised improvement ideas or, or the paperwork was 100% in order, a fresh box of donuts were sent from the logistics space in captain's care so that immediate recognition could be enjoyed right there and then on the pipe deck or in the smoker shack. The rig would return the favor, would spring rolls, energy drinks or other small items of appreciation. Our weekly incentive program rewarded operational outcomes and safe behaviors more than safe outcomes. In fact, it started life as a retention mechanism for the more senior staff who would depart us for higher day rates elsewhere. They would receive much more than junior staff in the incentives. With time, rig leaders decided they, they wanted all to have the same and forfeited much of their incentive payments so that the more junior staff could get more. Leaders saw it as their mission to double or treble the salaries for the junior staff, who often came from much less privileged backgrounds than themselves. They took pleasure in the difference this made. Their why do I work here changed. We changed our focus area, particularly on safety related items and behaviors every week. Items such as permitter work, stop card quality, assistant drillers, daily checklists, drops, volume controls, certification compliance, communications between, between drillers and mud loggers, and many more came and went as we improved together. Some focus areas stood the test of time, some did not work, and we then, in, uh, we then moved on to new ones to learn and improve more. On people, in our industry, there are many who claim to be world champions and know everything there is to know about their trade. I know you will have met many like that. We selected our seniors more based on the eagerness to learn more, less on the years of experience in isolation. In this place, many workers only got flights home every two years when working two months on, one month off patterns. We changed that. So they saw their families every two months as opposed to every two years and encouraged service providers to include this option in all their contracts or tenders. We celebrated efficiency and safety with pride and invited all companies operating near us to join in. We stole with pride and our good ideas were theirs to steal as well. Uh, we told the world as best we could, and it's in fact the only job I have ever had, where a number of press releases showed up on my personal scorecard for the year. We tried to set others up for success and celebrated their successes too, even if we were very competitive. When someone struggled at home or at work, we found ways to support, even from personal funds when not enabled by company systems. We were humble to what we did not know and the gaps we had not identified. We were curious to learn more, improve faster. And of course, uh, our operational results were excellent, both for efficiency and safe outcomes. 
Now, this had not always been the case. This particular rig had been released from the previous client due to shocking operational and safety performance. Both rig owners and ourselves were worried, and frankly, our staff was bumpy. But we improved that pace from bottom of the pile to top quarter within six months. On this location, we had the benefit of doing our work within a large company who lived human performance values across all areas of their operation. The leadership was inspiring and enabling. This made our efforts easy. We fitted in well. Our team was empowered as the experts in our field. It's with great pleasure and pride, therefore, that I invite you to focus on the image behind me. It is from Qatar. The guys looking over the handrail are looking towards their homes. The sun is rising. The image was created by the partners of one of my colleagues, an amateur artist. For me, it changes paradigms. It shows our industry in a different light than the public usually would uh, expect. I had a similar experience with my team when working in Syria back in uh, 2001 to 2005. Uh, and there I was accountable for two to three land rigs near the Euphrates River, close to the Iraqi border. Here the context of the wider company was not as advanced and respect and care certainly not values lived by all. However, we managed to create our own island of excellence where the crews would even come to the rig on their time off to help out when needed and all were engaged in the improvement drive. We were all better for it. Now, looking at both areas and both operations, clearly we have learned more since that time and we would have implemented better if we got the chance to do it again. The values would be the same though, respect, trust, and innate curiosity to learn and improve. Now, if you can relate to my personal stories, I hope you can agree with two assertions. First, it is possible for a determined leadership team to create an environment built on human performance principles, even when working in areas where our perceptions may think it is not possible. It is made easy if sheltered and supported by informed leadership, like in the Qatar example that I mentioned. Second assertion is that even in areas where there is no supportive leadership or enabling environment, it is possible for teams to create their own islands of excellence where real respect and care is the norm for that team. You will have these in your midst. You just got to find them, figure out how they do it, learn shamelessly and amplify in your sphere of influence. If you all agree that this is the direction of travel you want to embark on, boring as it sounds, it becomes about how to get there and to a certain extent, project management. Leaders who seek improvement needs to have a view of where their point A is. Where are we today? What is current status? They then need to define point B. What is our end goal? Then plot the way to get from A to B, coach, support and guide your teams on the way. When it comes to human factors and human performance, being explicit on defining point D is not straightforward. After all, we're, we are dealing with people's behaviors and attitudes. How can we change that? How can we measure it? How can we find meaningful KPIs? In some respects, it's about feeling. I'm sure, just like me, you will have arrived at a location at work or at home where you thought, hey, this feels different. This feels open. This feels good. There are also underpinning factual and behavioral traits that can be objectively introduced, measured and appraised. Both IOGP and many others have introduced and published tools intended to help as we go about changing conversations in offices, sites and coffee shops across the world. There is already a good start. Now, on the back of uh, a pandemic, it would be wonderful and my hope is that we can use the collaborative sphere, the way we manage to engage uh, each other across the world differently now than in the past, to accelerate that journey. And, and, and our effort as IOGP is to try and define point B 
for our industry. Our current draft ambition statement goes by 2025, our global industry has embedded human performance principles in how we design and operate our assets and facilities. Our leadership sets a tone of respect for diversity, equality and inclusive behaviors throughout. And the well-being of our workforce is a shared imperative. Now, why would we want that? Well, in my view and in our view, we believe it lays the foundation for the next steps in efficiency and safety as we embark on the transitions needed for the sustainable supply of clean energy the world needs to thrive. We will improve and land a statement with key partners late June, and we're looking for entities like Step Change and Safety to proactively support and help accelerate. One key item is to find a way for industry to structurally include human factors assessments in investigations. This could be a simple tool which forces the right conversation to be had. Yeah. If we agree that humans will make mistakes, however, it's hardly ever done maliciously, we need a tool to figure out, well, then why did the mistake happen? What was the context that the individual or team worked in that made an undesirable situation arise. More on that to come in the months ahead, and, and I also believe that Tim will talk a little bit more detail of what that could look like. In closing, uh, I wanted to revert back to the image and my colleagues behind me. The guys on my rig, looking to their families at home. In fact, they had two homes, one with their families, one on the rig. Now, if you're looking for a quick individual action, you may consider contrasting the two homes. One thing I always noted when visiting operational locations was the recreation room, the galley. And my conclusion was that I would never allow endless posters depicting compliance rules and photos of scary incidents in my own living room or my own dining area. Nor would I have endless posters of safety campaigns from days gone by clutter the corridors. So when I visit worksite, I make it my business to remove them and then shift out soft paintings, images of nature or celebratory images of the team. I expect the painting behind me still decorates the mess hall on the Alcor drilling rig in Qatar, together with photos of various award ceremonies and celebratory events. I invite you to consider this as one of your first individual actions towards your point B. Now, thank you very much for listening and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Olaf. I mean, very insightful. And by the way, I love, I love your, the picture in your background and, and the story uh, that you just uh, shared. Thank you. And uh, definitely our industry has access to much expertise in the human performance and human factor domain. So I, I was taking some notes on what you said about the collaboration acceleration. And, uh, you know, definitely I think that uh, there should be no reason why we can't accelerate and progress here, right? So I'd like now to get to Michael and actually building on your comments, Olive, you know, I'd like to hear from Michael, what could be the good practice and the lesson learned that we should consider now in what is the new norm post uh, COVID? Michael, please. Um, do you want to answer that question now or, or later, Lamberto? <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> uh, well, I think um, I was going to touch upon the new norm at the end of my talk. Um, well, I could share some thoughts at, at, at that point. Um, so perhaps if I might come back to that point um, at, the, at the end, so I do have to build a lead into it. Um, so first, thank you very much for the, the opportunity um, to speak today. Um, and obviously, you invited me to talk about the guide that I helped author with the, with the Energy Institute a couple of years ago, um, which very much focused on the human factors um, of organisational change. And the Institute felt that um, obviously change is always with us. Um, and despite decades of experience, it is felt that there's still a position where many changes, major changes were being implemented 
um, without sufficient thought or attention given to the impact on safety, particularly process safety, major accident risk. Um, and so it was felt by the Institute that there was a need to have um, new guidance providing um, a shared view of what is good practice on the management of change, particularly in the management of organisational change. Um, but in addition, um, I also want to share with you some experiences um, that I've had um, from inv being involved in organisational change. Um, I'm a member, independent member of an organisational change committee at a nuclear licensee. You might guess who they are from the, the picture at the bottom. Um, and also have been involved with a lot of organisational change in the onshore gas distribution industry in the UK. Um, and these changes that I've been involved in have ranged from um, very small changes, um, dropping three people from a control room, um, obviously in a, in a control room, very safety critical, vital to get those changes correct, um, through to a requirement to cut 10% of staff from a site that employed thousands of people. A major organisational change. Um, obviously, working on the front line at the level of operators, uh, also executive level changes and changing the, uh, the roles of the executive and the structure of the executive. Um, so dozens of changes um, um, which I would like to share with you. Um, next slide, please. Now, you say, why do we need to ask why is organisational change important and its management important? Um, a wall of pictures of disasters where organisational change um, was a factor. Um, I perhaps first refer to the explosion at the Longwood site um, quite a few years ago, but oddly quite relevant to today because not only had they made some moderate reductions in engineers and uh, maintenance staff, um, very interestingly, they had also relocated um, some of the plant engineers from Longford um, to Melbourne, hundreds of miles away. So it was an example of remote working, where if you wanted to involve an engineer, plant engineer, you would phone them up and you'll get advice on the phone. And this was thought to be a factor in the accident, because on the day of the accident, it's unclear what was happening. And they literally had to call the engineers on the phone. Could the engineers go and see what's happening? Could they go look for themselves? Well, no, they were 200 miles away. Um, had they lost some of their site-specific knowledge um, by being relocated. I thought that was the case. Um, what was going on was misdiagnosed, uh, it was mishandled. So whilst it was happened some 20 or so years ago, um, the relocation of engineers, somewhat analogous to today's uh, remote working. Um, Texas City refinery explosion. Um, again, it's a, a need to reduce costs, uh, very well, very, very familiar incident, but also decentralisation, decentralisation responsibility for safety. So again, another sort of interesting example of, hmm, what if you um, place responsibility more locally, uh, less oversight. Um, the Bunfield explosion, a fuel depot in the UK, um, interestingly, it wasn't so much an organisational change, it was an increase in throughput, um, but no increase in staffing and there were some issues with the reliability of the equipment which needed to be sorted but there was no time to do that. So in the Bunswood example in a way there should have been organisational change in response to changes in, in throughput and similarly the Equilon and Condé Vista explosions 
that both examples of where there's changes in process which should have led to changes in procedures and, and, and team in. So the EI guide is trying to get across the point that change can happen um, either because of I say financial requirements, new operating models, but can also happen or should happen due to changes in, in the plant and equipment. And these changes can lead to a, a loss of loss of competence. Um, it's often a case with voluntary redundancy um, that the people of my age, older people, are quite happy to take early retirement. So you lose that most experienced uh, cohort of people, which may also mean that you lose that sort of corporate memory. Um, and well, why do you have some of those safety arrangements in place? That memory may be lost. Obviously, you've got fewer people, may lead to workload issues. Um, if you decentralize, is there, is there a loss of control and mind and, and corporate capability? So, some obvious risks. Okay, so next slide, please. Now, of course, you look at those accidents, and with the benefit of hindsight, you might say, well, wasn't it obvious? You know, why did people miss those risks? And it is the case that at times the risks were foreseen, they were mentioned, uh, but there's words of caution or perhaps not, not listened to. So it leads to the question of, and the thought that there is, in a way, organizational blindness, deaf and blind um, to the risks associated with the change. And I think not only talking from the research, but talking from experience, you need to look at the dynamics of what, what's happened um, during a change process. And often, um, someone's perceived a major problem. Someone's saying to me the other day, we are in a crisis. And because we're in a crisis, we must change. And I always think when people use the word must, we must do this. We are in crisis. Um, we must save money. We must be better at management. We must do these changes for, for whatever reason. It betrays, in a way, how mission focused they are. They feel you must do this thing. They're focused on implementing these changes. They must do it. Um, and obviously, with that mindset, uh, with that mission focus, um, you perhaps have that tunnel vision. Um, you think we must go through with this. So if someone says, I have some concerns, I can see some risks, how likely are you to accept that challenge? How likely are you to explore and welcome that challenge? When you have that mission focus and a an attitude, you must implement, implement these changes, does it lead to you thinking these people, they're blockers, they're resistant to change. And there's often that phrase, resistance to change. We're all resistant to change. When in actual fact, it might be that you've got legitimate concerns and you've identified some legitimate risks, which are dismissed because it's felt we must make these changes. You're just blocking it you're resistant to change. Um, so that mission focus is a potential cause of that blindness. I think in addition, what you often have is this team of people and they've been asked to scope out these changes, to come up with a implementation plan and they go away and they do just that. They come up with a, a scope of changes, they plan out those changes. Um, they identify what they think the risks are, and they thought it all through, and then voila, they share it. So of course they think they've thought it all through. Um, very confident. They've put a lot of time into it. And there's a thing in psychology we call um, optimism bias. Um, and think change, particularly organizational change, often prone to optimism bias. Um, the changes will have their benefits. There will not be delays. Um, we've thought of everything. 
So in addition to optimism, in addition to mission focus, you got optimism bias and high level of confidence, often with highly driven, highly motivated people. So you're optimistic, you're confident, you thought of everything, and you must make these changes. So again, how likely are you to, to listen to challenge, to think, maybe I've missed something, maybe there are other risks. And thirdly, again, you've got a problem, you must solve that problem. That problem is present today, and you must solve it this year. When you look at organizational change, some of the risks are what we call latent risks. They will not be immediate. Um, they only become apparent some years later when a particular combination of circumstances combine. So if you're trying to highlight these risks, you're saying, well, it isn't an immediate risk. It might happen in a few years' time if these circumstances happen to um, coincide. So you're presenting that possible future risk that might happen against solving a crisis today. Um, so of course the people leading the change, well they might say, well, give us a hard evidence. You know, we need to hold back change, we need hard evidence. And there's not gonna be hard evidence about latent risks. It's a future potential risk that might happen. So again, if you people they set the bar high, the evidence for the risk must be very high to cause it to change path. Um, and, you, and often you can't meet that that high bar of evidence, particularly with, with latent risks. And indeed, if you're mission focused, you're optimistic, um, it can also lead to in what we might call reactance bias, um, where you see people raising challenges as being resistant to change, and reactance bias is where you believe the opposite of what they've said. If you think there might be an issue of competence, they might say, well, listen to that. I think, well, no, there won't be. I believe the opposite of what you're saying. You doubt the legitimacy and intent of the person raising the challenge. Um, and I think finally, um, and again, what I've often seen in practice is a lot of focus on what the end state of this change is going to be. You've planned out what the organization is going to look like, and it may look good, um, but what's that transition period? What are the key stages of change? What must happen at each stage to get to that end point? And that is often overlooked you know, in the rush to solve today's crisis. So what the end state may look positive, if that transition plan is poorly thought out, but obviously you just, you just do not get there. Um, and I think finally, and from perhaps in some of the worst examples, where change has been driven by the need to save cost, um, I think perhaps rarely, but occasionally, you do have what some people call a change in hope model. You change, hope it works out. Or a wait and see model. Particularly if you require hard evidence of risks, you reduce costs, you reduce staffing, wait and see what happens. Um, which from the safety point of view and a responsible approach to risk management is, is obviously uh, inappropriate. Which perhaps brings me to the last point here is that often change and organizational changes led by management specialists, whilst the um, concern for safety um, obviously requires uh, expertise in safety management and, and risk management and, and understand the process safety, process engineering. So you somehow got to get the process safety and the engineers to engage with the management specialist, which does not um, always happen. Uh, next slide, please. So the view of the Institute um, was that um, change, like all aspects of safety, uh, should be managed in a systematic, um, risk-based 
uh, proactive uh, approach. Um, so we laid out um, this, this flow, uh, a very standard flow really, um, perhaps amended a bit for organizational change, but very standard. You identify there's a change, um, you screen it, it's a big change or a small, small change. You look at the safety impact, are they large or small? Um, then a more detailed form of a risk assessment, consult. Once you've understood the risks, have risk controls, have a proper plan. Then I've got approval. And this is where people like myself come in. Uh, we have a, a committee that looks at the adequacy of that risk assessment, looks at adequacy of the risk controls and the tr transition plan. And we provide that independent view. Has the risk been foreseen? Is the plan adequate? So we try to balance that mission focus. We try to balance that optimism bias. We provide an independent, cold pair of eyes. Um, and uh, perhaps we just provide advice and commentary, uh, but pump sometimes we provide proof approval um, or rejection. Um, then of course you've got to implement um, and equally importantly after the change uh, do some sort of verification and monitoring of performance. Has it delivered the benefits? Have all the changes occurred? Um, so a systematic process. Uh, next slide please. A bit more about uh, commission process. Um, we would say good practice is that there's a management organizational change policy and a process that one's meant to go through. You don't wait for change to happen and make it up on the spot. No, you have a policy and process in the same way as you do for every other aspect of safety management. Um, maybe a committee. Um, I sit on the committee at least every month. We have a regular committee meeting. Maybe more than every once a month if there's a big change going through. And we sit regularly. Or so anyway, we monitor half the changes been recognized, how people entered into the management change process. Um, so we check that. Um, have people done the assessment? Um, and there's lots of small changes that you, that you sweep up in your, your regular meetings. Um, but then with the larger changes, uh, significant review, significant commentary um, and engagement on them. And this can only really happen if you've got policies and procedures and some sort of committee to, to progress that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as I said, first step, recognition. Um, and I would say I've been involved sometimes in a post hoc manner significant change has been pushed through. It's almost at completion. And then someone says, we've done no risk assessment. And you look at it and you go, hmm, you've made a significant change. There's no new job descriptions. You haven't looked at competence. These people need retraining. Um, all very late in the day. So recognizing change at an early point, understanding magnitude of that change. Some of those accidents, there's, change in the process or throughput, but recognizing that may require change in the organization. So recognizing change early on is vital. And then the screening is looking at the magnitude of change. If it's small, is it self-assessed by the local department? If it's major, is it a more sort of corporate level assessment? Um, and indeed, the largest changes may also have regulatory approval. I've been involved quite a few where there's a change in the safety case and it has to go to the regulator uh, for approval. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, risk assessment. In some sense, the risk assessment is very similar to things like HAZOP and in your standard type of risk assessment. You have guide words, you have checklists, you have some sort of rating scale. Um, so very similar. Guide words unique to organizational change, often looking at competence, workload, accountabilities, clarity for reporting lines, um, clarity of roles and responsibilities um, to prompt 
identification of um, organizational risks, um, including latent risks. And so by latent risks, we mean sort of changes to the organization which may have an impact in future years. Um, ensuring your risk assessment covers them as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, often the risk assessment looks like this, very standard type of tabular layout. What is the change? What's the potential impact? What, what causes impact? Look at likelihood and consequence. Uh, what are your risk controls? And then reassessing the risk. So very sort of standard layout. And I would say that most organizational change risk assessments take this type of form. Very standard, very straightforward. I would say from experience, immensely useful, immensely useful. And this achieves 95% of the value of, of risk assessments of organizational change. If you've got the right people doing it, people who understand the change, people who understand the organization, um, you get 90% of benefit from a tablet risk assessment such as this. Exceptionally, um, there is occasionally need to do other forms of assessment, uh, maybe a more formal workload assessment. There are specialist tools uh, that look at cognitive workload. So if there's a change in the control room, maybe you need to use a specialist tool for that. If you're changing roles, do you come up with new job descriptions? Do you need to do a competence gap analysis? Um, so there may, by exception, be some specialist analytic requirement. Uh, next slide, please. Transition plan. I say easy for people to skimp or cut this short. But when you force people into it and you say you want to make your change by September, what do you have to achieve to implement it in September? And you work backwards. That's a very good discipline. Um, to make people really realize what are all the things they must do if they really want to implement the change by September. Um, what's the sequence? What are your preconditions? So forcing people to think about that uh, may, means your transition plan is more realistic. And whole points. Now, whole point is where you said formally in July, you're going to stop and have a meeting and you're going to check. Have you changed job descriptions? Have you implemented the retraining? If you haven't, you can't go to the next step. And those whole points are very sort of powerful forms of, of governance, making sure that transition plan is being implemented and you can't move to the next stage until you've done the first stage. Uh, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, consultation. Um, um, easy to overlook risks, um, particularly in large complex changes. Have you foreseen all the risks? At that detailed level, do you understand everything? Uh, engaging um, throughout the organization um, will often give you insights and knowledge that you've overlooked, um, but may also uh, come up with solutions. Um, so we always say that consultation shouldn't fear people. People are not actually really resistant to change. They have legitimate concerns. They have knowledge that you do not have and ideas that you may not have thought of. So you do your risk assessment and you consult. Uh, next slide, please. Risk controls. Now, your risk controls often are very, very normal. Um, if you're downsizing, does that mean you're upskilling some people? If you're changing roles, um, are you changing job descriptions? Um, are you retraining people? Um, how can you demonstrate, how confident you've done everything? Well, really the guide says that you need to demonstrate you've gone through this process of identifying risks, assessing the risks, and having risk controls for each of them. And if those risk controls meet good practice, retraining, clear job descriptions, um, then you should have demonstrated that you have minimized that risk. So a very subjective and, and qualitative process. Uh, thank you. Uh, next slide. 
KPIs. Uh, I often find people hate uh, being asked to come up with KPIs to measure the success of their change. Um, we would perhaps mention that um, most organizational change fails to deliver the intended benefits. Um, so again, it's very good discipline at the outset to ask what are your success criteria and what are your measures of success going to be? Define that in advance and then measure it afterwards. And not only might this actually show you have been successful, it might also detect some unforeseen risks and impacts. So by having those KPIs, you can give assurance that safety has been maintained, or equally, you can identify some unforeseen risk which you can then manage. The KPIs would relate to the type of changes you've implemented. If you reduce starting levels, are you looking at overtime, um, stress? If you change in technology, are there any changes in error rates? Um, if you change roles, um, again, looking at um, staff um, stress, and, but also often just qualitative feedback from people will be sufficient. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a few come to the end, uh, lessons learned from practice. Uh, going back to, you know, why are organizations blind? It's often because they're you know, uh, mission focused, they're blind to the risks. So we actually do try and turn it around and we say to get support for management of change, we say we're here to help make change successful. We're here to help. We are not blockers. Um, we are helping you foresee the risks and helping sure that you manage them so that your change is successful and that you don't regret your actions a year from now. Or equally, if someone else is implementing the change, you won't regret their actions. So highlighting how you can help make things successful and avoid future risks. Um, thus get support for management change. Um, highlighting how whole points can contain that optimism bias and that mission focus. Um, and also, if you've gone through this process, um, people who are concerned about change will have more confidence in it and therefore be more supportive of it. If you can show a rigorous change management process, people may accept that change also. And next slide, please. Um, another thing from the nuclear industry, they have what they call organizational baseline, which is a database where they've recorded every safety critical drop. And they do this in advance and it's a maintained database. So when change happens, they can say, has it impacted any of these jobs? And so it's a trigger for management change and helps you assess that change. So a very useful tool for controlling change, standard practice nuclear industry, um, less so outside of it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, final um, lesson is to ask people to be called a papers of principles, but to lay out the logic of their changes. Uh, what would that end state look like and, and what are, what's the rationale for it? Um, yeah, define the rationale for the organizational structure, define the rationale for the spans layers. Um, what's the logic for organizational uh, de discipline of departments? And by again, obliging people to articulate that, it, it makes for better um, plans. Uh, next change, next slide, please. So come back to your question, Lamberto, the new norm. Um, of course, what is the new norm is yet to be seen. It's been in a state of flux. But obviously, there is talk about hybrid working, remote working. Some people I work with go, well, engineers can work from home. Um, called in, have these meetings like we are now. And of course, we would say there are risks with that. Um, some obvious risks, social isolation, um, communication risk, I'll refer you back to the Longford explosion. You know, can engineers really engage and understand things remotely? But in addition, over the years, how might it affect affiliation to the company, your ability to onboard new people, induct people into your culture? 
um, I know examples where organizational change has been put on hold because it can't be done remotely. You can't engage on contentious matters uh, on Zoom. And then you've got your operators who are on, on site engineers um, lazing around at home. Does it create that, that tension? Um, so lots of potential risks. And I think I'd be interested in the, the Q&A to hear um, any examples of, of uh, plans from members of the audience uh, for managing this new norm. How are you going to go about it? And in that Q&A, I'd, I'd share my thoughts with you as well. Uh, final slide, Caroline. Uh, the link to the guide uh, is um, shown. It's a free guide. Um, you have to register with the EI to um, get free free guide, but it is still free. Um, download it and hopefully it helps. Thanks very much. Many thanks, Michael. And uh, you know, I was uh, hearing on on that, and what is clear, you know, at least what what I see is that, uh, of course, um, there are potential latent risks associated with the new norm. Uh, but the way I see it, that we can manage them. I mean, if we start now, at a certain point of or your presentation, you were very right. If you want to change coming in September, you need to start in July and stop being reflected. I think that that is where we are, right? I mean, the pandemic has pushed us to change, but now the new norm is is uh, is coming to uh, to fruition or, or to a planning phase. Uh, so, what do you think, Tim? I see you know the slide is is uh, is up, and can you share how the helicopter industry? is uh, preparing to this new norm, to what is coming our way. For sure, thank you, uh, Lamberto, and uh, good morning to everyone. I'd, I'd like to start, if I may, just by saying how proud I am of being part of an industry that addressed the challenges of delivering safe transport when COVID first presented itself last year. And it was only through a determined and very collaborative effort that in a matter of weeks, helicopter operators had developed and agreed a safe transportation protocol, much of which remains in place today globally, allowing offshore flights to continue safely, whilst other industries, as we know, were effectively closed down. And we've had to make some concessions along the way to get by, but as we emerge from the pandemic and we consider weaning ourselves off the current travel protocols, I'd like to think that rather than just reverting wholesale to previous practices, we can use the COVID interruption as a catalyst for meaningful change in our safety thinking. Can we go to the next slide, please, Carolyn? I'd like to share Heli Offshore's vision, which is of a safer front line served by an open, responsive and aligned industry. So our focus is on ensuring that frontline personnel have the tools, the training, the techniques and the technology that they need to perform their task to the best of their ability. And this is a human performance based vision, recognizing that people on the front line do safety every single day. And to do it well, they need to be supported by the systems within which they operate. It recognizes that humans aren't perfect. As Olaf said earlier on, they will occasionally make errors and mistakes, but that equally they are capable of recovering from them well. And our job in managing the systems is to create a system that's error tolerant. And there's work to do. I think uh, we all recognise that some elements of today's operating systems potentially provoke error in some cases. We need to understand that better. And as we fix those systems, given that several stakeholders obviously have an influence on frontline systems, it's difficult to address these changes independently. So we do need an aligned approach to fix, uh, fix the elements that deliver the biggest safety benefit. Next slide, please, Carolyn. So last year, Heli Offshore uh, ran a survey in conjunction with IOGP's aviation advisors to better understand the areas of impact that we've seen from COVID. We saw some really positive effects, um, growth in safety leadership, safety reporting. Uh, and that was great, indicating that good connections were maintained between the front lines and their management. The challenges that we saw unsurprisingly arose from international travel restrictions, pilot access to simulators, was hugely impacted where training centers are in different countries. Full pilot training program cycles run over a three year period. And so you can easily revert to training using aircraft in the short term. It's what we used to do years ago, in fact. 
and so there's no short term safety impact. But once simulator access is available again, catch up programs need to be assessed. Do we need to do them? If so, let's plan them, cost them, support them uh, and avoid leaving any training gap. Unsurprisingly, with changes to operating protocols, to new procedures introduced, limitations and general concerns around COVID, there was an increase on workload and fatigue at the front line, and the potential was seen for an increase in distraction related events as everybody juggled new experiences and challenges in and out of work. And travel and movement restrictions also impacted how we did our safety assurance processes, including compliance audits with processes modified to allow remote oversight whilst we couldn't travel. And depending on where you sit, that's either been seen positively or negatively. The next slide, please, Karen. So in terms of opportunities to manage human performance more effectively post COVID, I think there are three main considerations. One, we've got to reset and recover from any interim mitigations that we put in place. Don't leave any gaps behind. I think we really do need to gain industry recognition and alignment on an approach to well-being risk management. And that's kind of a new concept for us, I think. We'll talk about that a little more. We could also review our processes of safety oversight, shifting our focus from or to a mix of the more traditional compliance monitoring alongside the introduction of observational programs, which will allow us to learn from normal work. And it's these last two aspects, considering the people and considering the systems they work in that I'd like to expand on just now. So thanks, we can drop the slides for a second, Carolyn. And uh, let's just talk about a focus on well-being risk management. People do safety and to do it well, they've got to be operating within a system that's designed to support them. And the benefits of a proactive approach to mental health and well-being management have been brought really sharply into focus. So we could probably drop the slides for a second, uh, Karen, and we'll come back to that one later. I think what we've learned is that the traditional expectation that employees would come into work, leave all of their worries and concerns on the doorstep and be able to focus solely on the task that they're being asked to perform is unreasonable and perhaps a little bit outdated. We talked about a world that appears to be increasingly complex and unpredictable. And as our own sector transforms over the next couple of decades, uh, and we see the introduction of new technology, new offshore energy customers, and an influx of new personnel, we need to be building on our understanding of how we successfully manage positive mental health and well-being on our front lines recognizing that it affects many of us. And at some point in our working lives, I think the statistics suggest that at least half of us will be in a position, albeit for short periods, to benefit from the support that a mental wellbeing program could provide. In aviation, the German wings accident in 2015 triggered some laws which came out very recently requ requiring operators to establish uh, peer support networks. Uh, these networks were overseen or are overseen by a qualified aviation psychologist. Peers are selected and trained across the workforce so that any pilot can have access to of support when they need it. And uh, interestingly, of those pilots who participated in these required systems, um, 80 plus percent have reported that they're satisfied with the assistance that they provide, which is a really encouraging statistic. So that regulation will always be the bottom line, but those required peer support programs are targeted towards pilots. The maintenance community has been less well represented. And indeed, other safety critical roles haven't been targeted by regulation. So within our organisations, uh, we need other layers of activity such as mental health first aid programmes to support all personnel. And that needs to become the norm. I think there's more to do beyond the current provision of an anonymous employee assistance program phone number. The next generation of our frontline staff, our millennials, talk far more openly about mental health and wellbeing than they've ever done, than we've ever done, sorry. And through their educational experiences, they have an expectation that the topic's not just discussed, but it's taken seriously and it's managed effectively. So we need to have systems in place to ensure that their performance is maximised. 
I think a sharing of best practice from multiple industries to create a standard on well-being management that's agreed, expected, and indeed ultimately contracted for is surely a valuable consideration for us all. So changing lanes and, and moving on to the other opportunity that I highlighted earlier, Alberto, I'd like to talk a little bit about observational programmes that look at normal work. Safety management in aviation identifies key risks and applies controls which are tested for effectiveness through compliance monitoring, uh, but we also get data from accident or incident investigation. Yet within our own organisations and indeed across industry, there's still a disconnect on how this is done most effectively. And I don't think we've quite bridged the gap between describing the work that we think people should be doing every day and learning what they actually do in reality. And one way of filling this gap is through the use of workplace observations, recording what happens in live operation. There aren't any regulatory credits for conducting workplace observations, so few people do them at the moment despite them being potentially a really valuable source of safety data. The recent publication of IOGP's 690 refers to programmes including LOSA, the really unattractively named Line Orientated Safety Audit. We'll just call it LOSA for now. But it also refers to maintenance observational programmes. And this reference and an expectation that we'll have these in place is a huge step forward the routine establishment of these initiatives has a significant potential to improve frontline human performance, whilst the safety regulations slowly catch up. If we can come back to the slides, please, Carolyn, we'll just share the basic approach behind LOSA. Um, the LOSA uh, is underpinned by a threat and error management philosophy developed by James Clement at the University of Texas uh, around about 2006. It's a really well established process in international airline operations with tens of thousands of observations feeding into a powerful database of the real life factors which influence human performance in the cockpit. Under LOSA, uh, de-identified observations are conducted by trained observers who sit in a jump seat on live flights. They're as close as that picture in the top right hand side. And they conduct these observations in a campaign which typically takes place over a two to three week period. Once all the data from the observations is collated and analysed, a safety improvement plan is developed and then it's actioned and potentially you run a follow up or a targeted follow up LOSA several months later to assess the impact of any changes made. Critically, the LOSA programme prioritises corrections to the system over corrections to the operators. The threat and error management model, which I talked about and those is based on, and you see um, sort of outline of it on the left there, recognises that threats exist in the environment every day. And the operator's job, in this case the pilots, is to anticipate, to recognise and to manage those threats. And human operators tend to do this quite well. They're often assisted by procedures, by technology or by training, and, and they do occasionally make errors. Threats are sometimes missed or mishandled. And if that's the case in LOSA terminology, the aircraft may end up in what is known as an undesired aircraft state. But that in itself might be recognised and might be mitigated. All the way up until that point, nothing of consequence has occurred. No safety report has been filled in. Yet the LOSA observation is able to identify and code the original threat and the way it was handled by the crew. And following a very recent development, LOSA also captures the presence of crew competencies. So we can see those that were there and successfully lead to a catch and recovery, or we can also capture the missing competencies that lead to an undesired aircraft state. Those pilot competency frameworks cover typically non-technical and technical skills and the associated behaviours that go with those skills. But they've been established internationally now through a huge collaborative effort. Uh, so it's agreed across uh, the airline industry what those skills and behaviours look like. And they provide exactly the sort of behavioural data that we look for in accident or incident investigation. So we can get that data now without having to experience the accident or the incident at all. 
But more crucially, we can capture the behaviours and the actions that make things go right as well as the actions and behaviours that make things go wrong. So if we agree to establish this potential data source as part of our new approach to safety management, it perhaps makes sense to align the classification of the output data with other traditional data sets, including accident and incident investigation. This is what Olaf was talking about early on. If we can switch to the last slide, please. This last slide shows a taxonomy that's used in aviation to classify the influencing factors in incidents. It's called the Human Factors Analysis and Classification System, or HFACS for short. It identifies factors that influence performance outcomes at the operator level, at the supervisory level, the environmental and the organisational levels. And as Olev said, the IGP Safety Committee are considering adopting a variation of a taxonomy such as HFACS for all incident investigations to cover aviation and HSE. And that in itself will be a really positive step. But there's another gain to be had if we could agree to use a similar human performance taxonomy, taxonomy sorry, for normal workplace observations as well. That would allow us to capture the presence of performance influencing factors from multiple sources and address them directly, potentially, on a daily basis. Thank you, we can go away from the slides, Carolyn. So this year, Heavy Offshore's work efforts are focused on promoting the internationally recognised pilot competencies, developing an equivalent competency framework for maintenance personnel. And supported by IOGP's GIP 37, we're also promoting the use of the LOSA programmes and the development of a framework for an equivalent uh, observational program in maintenance. It doesn't exist today, but we could do that. We could have equivalent of LOSA observations in the hangar. And this method of capturing this safety data from the cockpit and the hangar and identifying the factors that lead to operational drift is potentially a really powerful way of reconnecting supervisors to their frontline teams, especially if, as the systems mature, the supervisors actually become the observers. If we can use observational programs to learn how safety is performed every day and pass that information on to our future colleagues, I believe that's as valuable as them knowing what's caused the accidents of the past. In conclusion, I would offer uh, Lamberto that the interruption provided by COVID gives us an opportunity to reflect on our current safety systems. Perhaps post COVID, we don't simply have to revert to previous form. Our front lines do safety for us every day, and we need to understand how they do that. And we need to learn what we can do to increase the probability of them doing it consistently. Perhaps we can use the pandemic as an inflection point in our safety management development and consider new ways of understanding, supporting and improving human performance on the front line. Thank you for letting me share those thoughts with you, Lamberto. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks to you, Tim. I think that uh, you know, it's a great, vi great vision and uh, yeah, we should uh, leverage as an inflection point. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for uh, for sharing. And I mean, uh, I think there is a lot to digest of what we heard so far, and uh, I'm sure our audience have uh, a lot of questions. So I will take the the time to remind that we have a Q&A. So please put your question on uh, on the Q&A and uh, upvote like you know those questions that uh, that you want to get uh, you want to get answered. Uh, but I like now to start asking. All of actually, and, uh, and hearing about you know your, your presentation, what is your biggest frustration in the human factor, human performance domain for our industry? Yeah, thanks, Lamberto. There are many, uh, but but let me try and answer it uh, this way. So, so, so my um, my personal first experience of a major accident hazard uh, was in 1975 with the Berger Istra uh, uh, tanker incident. Uh, my father was a captain and he worked for the same company. 
Um, I was then personally connected or understood the ECOFIS Bravo blowout again because of family uh, relations. Um, of course, we all know about Piper Alpha. Uh, I had a, another personal experience on the 13th of October 2000, where my actions or, or lack of action could have cost the lives of a, a whole crew, 110 people we were on board. Uh, thankfully, we, we got away with it. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the terrible events in, in 2010 that we will all remember. And um, one thread which they all have in common is the human factor imperatives that underpins everything we do. And in spite of the, all these incidents, unfortunately, we have not changed enough conversations at the call phase. And, and, and as a person of frustration, with myself, uh, actually, that it's taken so long before I recognize it in myself. Um, and, 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 and I keep reflecting, well, how, you know, how, how could I have done that better? How could I put more focus on it and communicate uh, these imperatives in a, in a better way? Now, there's another uh, frustration, um, and that is uh, there's lots of people with insights, and you've heard three here, uh, you know, Tim and, and, and Michael, you know, you know, present deep insights in, in, in how we can actually go about getting better at this. Uh, unfortunately, there's lots of people with that level of insight which are not heard. And sometimes we almost work in, in, in competition with each other. Um, and, and, and I see it, if anything, as, as, as one of my tasks. You know, if, if there's some people who have got the excellence experience, who have got the insights, how can we as an industry bring that out uh, so that we can change that conversation in that coffee shack, on that rig floor, on that production site, or on that logistics uh, base. Uh, so, 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 so those are my 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 key frustrations, and and, and that frustrations because it's something I feel sometimes I can maybe help uh, do something about. Uh, but equally, of course, it's it's not straightforward, and it's not uh, it's not something that you can solve by sending an email or or, or having a meeting. It it is bigger than that. And yeah, th thanks. Uh, I can only I can only really agree, Olaf. It's uh, absolutely right. And all this challenge, of course, do not exist. You know, only in the front line, or you know, what I'm thinking is in today work environment, uh, with all the sudden uh, changes that the pandemic has brought. You know, it really makes me to think and ask Michael uh, what he has been presenting uh, just earlier. You know, Michael, do you see the hybrid home working style that you have been uh, mentioning impacting safety? And if so, how how we can manage this specific uh, issue, right? Uh, th thank you. Yes, and then I was been thinking whilst listening to people speak, and I think on, it doesn't have to be have the potential to impact safety. And I think one of the lessons learned from previous you know, major accidents is to be very disciplined in identifying what the risks might be, as well as the opportunities. And, and you should recognize that whilst you know, Zoom meetings in one sense are somewhat impoverished uh, in terms of the social engagement, but can be very functional and very productive. Um, so there are, there are those, those benefits. Um, but obviously, the hybrid working, um, working from home, you can see many potential um, risks there. Um, we mentioned the, the impact on mental well-being. You know, you've got the social isolation, uh, but also it's a loss of that distance between work and home. You know, we might all hate the commute, but it meant there was a clear break between work and home. If you're working at home all the time, do you really have that psychological disconnect? Also, whilst you might hate the commute, it was getting you out. You were walking and exercising. If you're at home all the time, does it increase that sort of sedentary working style? So I think one thought is, we're very used to the idea of having behavioural norms 
when you're at work and, and sort of safety norms. So I think with hybrid working, um, anyway, you need some hybrid working behavioral norms. How do you ensure there's a disconnect between work and home? You, know, you turn off your phone, you turn off your computer, you turn off your email, you have that clear break. How do you ensure you don't become too sedentary? Too sedentary? Do you have some discipline of, of exercise? Um, but also, when you're in the workplace, you have all those spontaneous points of contact, which you lose when, when you're not uh, sharing a workplace. You can also lose that if the organization moves towards a hot desking policy. We don't need everybody in all the time. So you only have one desk for two people and you share and you don't have your team area anymore. So of course there's a risk there that you lose that engagement, you lose that interaction. Um, and it has two effects. Firstly, it affects things like um, affiliation to the company. But also when we talk about safety culture, we use terms like trust, teamwork, communication. Well, if you minimize contact with people, how does that impact that trust, that teamwork, that, that stand the quality of communication? So again, I think with hybrid working, then you need new new ways of working that in a way curate those opportunities for contact and engagement. And you recognize that that needs to be more than a functional discussion about some aspects of engineering but perhaps you need to create those opportunities where people can maintain that social relationship at work that maintains that trust, maintains that teamwork that we see as so important to safety culture. And I think the points I sort of cover are what you might call the latent risks, the safety culture, the social relationship, the trust, the teamwork, which may be maintained with a year of lockdown, but with years and years of hybrid working? Is it a risk that that could be eroded? So I think we need these new behavioral norms about how to manage ourselves when we work at home and how do we maintain that trust and teamwork in a, in a context of, of minimized uh, high contact with hybrid working. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks to you, Michael. And, you know, I see that and so, I think that somehow we'll have been experiencing, you know, some of uh, of this condition, right? Uh, and uh, but at the same time, now, you know, I'd like to ask Tim reconnect with what we all uh, what he said. With all things that is getting back to normal, uh, do you think there is a risk that the current focus that we're having on mental health, right? You, you talked about about mental health, about well-being, right? Do you see a risk, maybe, that this focus might kind of receding a bit, you know, post-COVID? Um, I think I do, Lamberto. Uh, there's a risk of that happening, certainly. I mean, we've had this extraordinary collective experience over the last year and a half, uh, which has pulled us all into a place where I think we see and understand what's happening now, a little bit more than we did perhaps 15, 18 months ago. Um, but there's always a danger, you know, if we smoothly come out of um, COVID, he said, um, it, but if we emerge from COVID and other things start to show up and become more immediate, if we haven't yet embedded the idea that mental well-being is a critical part of human performance, um, it's very easy that that can drift. If we haven't systemized or put things in place, to manage that if we haven't put our people at the center um, of the safety focus um, then yes there is a risk that addressing understanding what we need to do to manage uh, mental well-being better is potentially dropped um, so I, I think we do have to look at it as an imperative and it's still, the, the regulation's done it to some extent on the pilot side of things um, the real shame is that it hasn't uh, adequately addressed other safety critical areas such as maintenance, as I talked about. And indeed, you know, everybody who supports the pilots and the maintainers on the front line. So, yeah, I think we have to be uh, we have to be quite purposeful in understanding what our organisational commitment is going to be 
to manage the mental well-being of people within our own systems. Indeed, and there are a few questions that are coming through the Q and A, uh, and of course, you know, the, the more I come, the, the more get published and they got liked. Uh, but I like to start, uh, you know, from uh, the most liked, and and then. Uh, go up as the more come, and of course we'll we'll get through that. Uh, and of course, you you talk about you know a lot about the um, this aspect, the well-being, the mental health. Uh, but I was thinking, Holev, at the beginning, he was tell he was telling us you know about this plan from point A, from moving from point A from to point B, and of course. Uh, you know, he was saying we need to define it. Uh, we need to define what is the, you know, where we are today, of course, but that's maybe easier, uh, but where we want to be, right? And that's, you know, it's not really straightforward, he said. And I think that even less straightforward, and it is connected with the question that we got from Dan Birne, uh, and he's saying, you know, what can we do more to ensure the mental health and well being? Um, and I would say from an IOGP perspective, from a global perspective, so that we can take into account within, of course, the, the sphere of uh, our human factor focus, right, on that side. So what, where we are uh, on point A in mental health today and, you know, where we should be in point B and what we can do uh, as a global uh, oil and gas industry, Olaf, please. I think there, there is a, a bit of uh, frozen. Yeah, that doesn't matter. I, I could offer a thought or two, Lamberto. Yes, please. And I think listen to the comment about and take more care of mental health. I think one thing that's not perhaps been mentioned uh, and something I think is changing, but certainly if you go back a few years, there's a lot of stigma and their mental health, um, particularly in sort of male orientated um, environments. You know, how good are men at sharing their feelings, let alone talking about depression and anxiety, um, um, feeling sad. Um, so I think in terms of how can we take more account of mental well-being? And human factors. I, I think part of it is moving to a position where it's recognised that um, yeah, mental health is something that yeah, should not be viewed as a weakness or a deficiency on some someone's part. It, it doesn't mean that they are, they are a weaker, lesser person if they're suffering from depression or anxiety or they're finding life um, it, it, it's a challenge. So creating, and we use the word psychological safe environment where you feel safe to share your feelings. You're not going to be ridiculed. You're not going to be you know, humiliated or, or looked at as a, a weak person if you share your feelings, if you share that you're feeling sad and depressed. But instead, you're in a culture where if you share these thoughts, um, you will be supported, listened to. So I think generating that psychological safe environment to talk, to share feelings, and, uh, and you have trust in your colleagues that you can do that, um, is, is an important step to allowing mental health being um, drawn into um, a more holistic approach to human factors. And I think secondly, um, and what helps with that is understand you know, where does depression, anxiety and stress come from? And, and if you can help people understand that, it kind of normalizes mental health. Uh, it's not something that just happens to other people. It can happen to all of us. Um, and if you normalize it, you've understood it, you can create that, that safe environment for people to talk and share. And if you understand it, you can better manage it. Because um, there are things, you know, if someone's going through a traumatic experience, the last thing you should do is ask them to repeat that experience. It re-traumatizes them. Um, 
but you perhaps ask them how they feel and ask them how to manage things um, in the future. So if you understand what to do when someone has um, depression, it uh, gives you more confidence to be, then be able to um, engage. And there are things such as Metal First Aid, which is become quite popular now, gives you some basic understanding, some basic skills, so you can confidently engage with your colleagues. So you've reduced the stigma, you've got a safe environment to talk about things, and you've got the individual skills and knowledge to be able to engage with people, mental health. Um, I think these sort of things would help get mental health uh, drawn into a sort of wider human factors um, strategy. Uh, thank you. Yeah, if, if I can add uh, just uh, just the yeah, IOGP views on, on this, Lamberto. So, so it, it 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 helped certainly me and and and, and us at IOGP when we when we drew up the sort of mental health risk in a bow tie type diagram, uh, very sketchy, very very high level, but at the same time it, it it leaves no doubt in my mind that that the risk of a major accident hazard release uh, due to COVID has increased. Uh, distraction events, uh, you know, mental health aspects will, will for sure drive that risk up. Uh, and then it becomes incumbent on, on us or, or me and IGP to try and translate that because our, our, our medical experts, they understand this well already, uh, but decision makers may not. So, so what we're trying to do is to translate that risk into, well, what, what does it actually mean at the, at the coal phase? And, and we will be publishing uh, documents in, in, in that domain in, in, um, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, what we're also doing is uh, by the end of the year, we will have a well-being framework uh, published for companies to pick up and use and say, well, you know, how do we structurally incorporate this in, 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 in our companies? Uh, and I also, uh, of course, I'm aware that the ISO are actually publishing guidelines as well on 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 this aspect. Um, I think COVID actually um, is, is a huge opportunity in this respect as well, because it is actually becoming OK to talk about mental health. It is OK not to be OK. And the conversations that I'm having are getting gradually deeper and deeper. I open up more and I hear other people also open up more. Um, so, so, so I think it is an opportunity for us to, to focus more on that. And there's stuff that we can do individually. Uh, you know, when you when you ask somebody, well, how are you doing? And, and the answer you get back is, well, not too bad. Uh, well, that means it's bad. It's just not quite too bad yet. But, but maybe we can go deeper. Yeah. And maybe we can individually reach out to more people and, and, and just check and, and, and open those conversations. Uh, so so I, I see that as, uh, as an opportunity to, to get away from the taboo around mental health and, and well-being that uh, that we've lived in uh, until today. Love it. I, I, I fully agree. I mean, it, uh, if something was good on that side, it's, it's really that has been opened up. And I seen I had the same experience. I've been seeing a lot of conversation, you know, and that happened, you know, both at work, right, with colleagues and with the family or friends. So it has been absolutely uh, uh, something, a big change on, on the cultural um, aspect. Uh, so I'm looking at to, to the Q&A and I see that uh, Angela uh, McLean got a lot of upvotes on uh, her question uh, team. Uh, so I'd like you to give her some feedback on what are the thoughts of workforce who are being observed and uh, do they feel they are being scrutinized or they are willing to engage and learn lesson? A great question, absolutely, thank you. And, and it comes up uh, anytime uh, any organization thinks to uh, put a LOSA uh, campaign in place. Hang on, there's somebody sitting in the cockpit looking at what I'm doing, you know, uh, what are they recording? Well, the way around that absolutely is to have a promotional campaign uh, before you run uh, the LOSA observations. And personal experience, having uh, run a, a campaign in a previous uh, with a previous employer and also connecting to other operators who've run similar campaigns. Once that communication is done, this is what LOSA sets out to do. We're not recording personal information about the crews. We're recording uh, information about how a de-identified crew operates within the system for the purpose of correcting the system, not immediately feeding back in trying to correct the individual. 
There is um, absolutely no blockage in this area. I think um, I, I'm trying to think in, in offshore aviation. I think we've done something like 500 plus um, observation flights. And I think there's one crew who they always have the they reserve the right to um, say they don't want an observer on their jump seat. I think one crew out of 500 took that right, but then ultimately actually took part in a laser observation later. So it, it's about communication. It's about understanding what's going to come out of the system. This isn't a punitive exercise. This isn't targeting you as individuals. This is trying to understand how does everyday work work uh, and how do we as uh, those who manage the process of the procedures, the training, the equipment around that, how do we consider how we best support the individuals in the cockpit. Same absolutely true in the maintenance environment. If you do something uh, in the maintenance environment, again, get that connection uh, of understanding what the program is trying to achieve and that fear of being observed uh, very quickly dissipates. So, Michael, I could offer a another perspective, uh, not, not, not a um, contend in that, being one of the people who, who can be an observer. Um, but I perhaps share that um, I was listening to a talk from um, um, Shell the other day, and the approach they took, and this was for operators and, and maintenance people on a refinery, was they actually trained up the operators and maintenance teams in a way to do that self-assessment. So rather than being observed, they were trained in human factors, they were trained in uh, the psychology of um, compliance and violations and, and uh, performance. And then were empowered to do self-assessment of their work environment, their procedures, their, their, their training, their supervision arrangements. Um, and part of that training, part of the um, philosophy was that you know, it is human to err. Um, and we understand that you will make mistakes, we will make mistakes, we all make mistakes. And the purpose of this self-assessment is for you to help understand how you might make mistakes, to recognise that you may, to understand those potential mistakes. And then you, um, your team, um, helps come up with the solutions. So it removes any sort of concerns of observation because you're self-assessing and you, you're coming up with solutions um, with, with some route by um, engaging with management and engineers um, to get some of the solutions implemented. Um, now this obviously takes to a certain level. I mean, self-assessment, like operation maintenance people can go to a certain level in terms of understanding human factors, human performance, um, but went um, quite a long way, um, achieved a lot, and the, the reaction from the teams was 100% positive. They felt that they'd been listened to, they felt they'd been empowered, um, they felt that the, there's no stigma to human error, they've been destigmatized, and, and they had become part of the solution. Um, so a very, uh, very effective approach. Um, which I think Shell um, led on. Thank you. And thanks, and thanks, Michael, because you know all you say is you know is, is reconnecting with uh, with the previous presentation, and uh, and actually I like to get through the Q and A again, and I was reading uh, a few of the questions coming through, and uh, I was looking at the the one from Dennis. And as Simone Danis says, you know, of course, there are some uh, good idea from uh, Hall of Presentation on the Highlands of Excellence, right? And, uh, and, but he has some thoughts and say, what about if the organizational culture might not support it, right? And I was thinking of what you were saying actually during the, your presentation, Michael, when you were talking about uh, the cultural induction and so on. So I'd like to, to get to this question. Uh, I'd like to ask Hall of, uh, you know, consider that he has been talking about this, this excellence. Uh, what are, that is Dennis' question, what are some characteristic of this Highlands that we can identify? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, thanks, Dennis. So in, in my experience, it is, it is often the soft side 
So it's easy maybe to talk about respect and respect and care, yeah. Um, but it's harder to prove it. It's something that you got to feel, and it's it's a little bit out of our comfort zone actually as as an industry. Um, I think there is something about the tone that leadership sets around uh, learning and curiosity. Yeah, it is about when you go and visit the site and when you speak to people. Um, listen deep and intently and try and understand their perspective more than than maybe you've done in the past. And it's it's something that was never one of my strengths. And I have to consciously, you know, force myself into that space. Uh, but it changes the tone and you get more out of it. And, and, and you understand you get the information from the people that, that, that really matter. Yeah, the people that really have the depth of insight. Um, and that, that to me, changes the tone, it changes the culture, it's a curious one, it's a desire to improve in, in whatever you do, and, 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 and you've got to live that. And, and, and I think the truth is when you, when you actually get there, um, you probably never know, because your desire to improve even further will, will keep you restless and seeking for even more. Yeah. So it, it's a continuous improvement journey, if you like, that you need to be on. Does that make sense? Indeed, and I, I absolutely. And uh, and I was looking at uh, the other questions that were coming through, and uh, and I think that it makes sense from from what we we get. I mean, from the audience, I see that it makes sense. I mean, it's stimulating uh, that uh, you know the right thoughts. Uh, and I was I was looking at uh, the other very high voted question uh, from Ronnie. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, Michael can give us, you know, his uh, professional psychological view on on that, uh, because he Ronnie is asking in this digital world, uh, you know, how online training module the solution, or are we taking the easy way out and losing the human touch? Now, of course, you know, the online training also have been happening and had been uh, useful even before the pandemic. Um, but I, I see that most of uh, those training that were uh, instructor led in the past year probably have been kind of instructor led online on, uh, on a webinar. This forum as well, right, is now kind of virtual. So Michael, what do you think? Or, you know, if you think that this is a problem as well, you know, what would be your suggestion to make it uh, more human, you know, when we do virtual? So I think I'll take a step back and I say when one develops training, you should go through a process and at the start of the process, you define the learning objectives, what you're trying to achieve from this training. And then you look at the learning needs and what's an appropriate form of training. And if the learning objective is to impart knowledge, perhaps some technical knowledge about a piece of equipment, then the vital sort of functional online training might be sufficient. Of course, you are, you are imparting knowledge and information. But there's a lot of training out there, very, very important training, particularly in the offshore industry, which is all about non-technical skills, decision making, communication, delegation, coordination, um, uh, making decisions uh, when you're in a, in a time critical emergency situation. So all that crew resource management, team resource management type of non-technical skills, which you may be able to teach principle online, but part of that training is meant to be immersive. You are put in that role, you are put in a bit of a time critical situation, you're simulating that environment um, and you've got to instantly interact with colleagues, communicate, um, process information and make decisions. I find it very difficult to imagine how you can uh, do that uh, in an online environment. Um, some sort of simulated work environment is a more normal context for that. Um, so I think as ever, you need a, perhaps a hybrid approach 
If it's technical training, knowledge and information, perhaps online will be sufficient. If it's not too complex, you know, a static online environment might be sufficient. But the second you start getting into rich non-technical skills, teamwork, shared situation awareness, decision making un under stress, developing the non-technical skills, I would say, well, the, the training environment needs to be suitable for that. Um, and I think that is your traditional face-to-face -face physical training environment. Uh, thank you. If, if I may, Bajenda, Michael and, and Labata, just to thank you, I fully agree. What, what we uh, see specifically in the Wells domain, where we've engaged with, uh, with the sort of accreditation bodies, uh, IADC and IWCF, what we see is that the online training for content-based um, actually has continued online uh, and, and, and it, it, it has done well. We don't see any changes really, uh, but we're very focused on the opportunity that this brings, yeah? Uh, because it means that in the past, people were expected to go to a classroom every two years to, to, to get their certifications and keep them up to date. And what we'd like to do is to move to a world where actually you get more frequent learning interventions online, so continuous professional development, and then still get together, but then focus solely on the human factor domain, or focus solely on learning activities which, which needs you to come together with other people. So, so you can make much more conscious choices as to what are the learning objectives of this particular event. And I actually see this as a great thing that could, could make us better, that can improve us. Thanks, Olaf. And uh, I'd like now to change a bit uh, the subject here and get to a question from Keisha Rogers, Rogers and that is for team uh, definitely. And ask, the question is, do you see LOSA as a mean to assess ground handling stuff as well? I mean, is, is a process on top of that, is a process better owned by uh, from a compliance management or compliance management function team? Uh, yeah, thanks, Lombardo. Thanks, Keisha. Um, yes, great question. I think um, the philosophy of a workplace observational program can be applied to uh, any working area. In fact, uh, you just need to understand uh, really what are the competencies that uh, the individuals working in there um, uh, desire to have? What are the tasks and the processes, the threats and the areas that uh, might occur? I think we know the areas. We just need to understand the threats that occur in there. So LOS has been a really well developed process for the cockpit environment, but we can adapt. We can change that philosophy. Same philosophy still applies. I talked about putting it into maintenance uh, and we think we can do that relatively well um, using the same philosophy. But of course, yes, absolutely. You can put it into ground operations. We could put it into other safety critical areas um, uh, as well. So it's, it is transportable. We need to do some work on it. You can't just, um, you know, uh, flip it overnight, but uh, it is developable. And uh, I think there are um, experts across the industry who can help us uh, shape uh, and develop what we need to uh, apply into these new areas. Indeed, and I would also take another question here that is not directly uh, human factor uh, related. Uh, all of it that, that might be uh, well suited for you. Uh, it talks about a vaccination and it, the point is there still is something that, uh, although not directly related, is something that we will need to deal with uh, now, now that uh, hopefully, you know, in uh, the pandemic is is going to be resolved. Now, in, not in all the countries we are on, on the same uh, situation, but hopefully uh, the things will be improving. So the question from Stephen is, how will the industry manage the potential uh, they call force of vaccination, but the point is this requirement being implemented uh, on the offshore operators. Uh, and he says that, of course, this might be kind of creating some uh, concern on the us versus them mentality. What do you think, Olaf? Uh, yeah, I think I think he's right. It's 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 a concern. It's a big dilemma, actually. Uh, and it's much broader than just, uh, you know, the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated. If you look at this at the global scale, um, you know, you have uh, 
the haves and the have-nots in terms of countries. Uh, you have some vaccines which are perceived in some countries to be better than uh, than other vaccines. Yeah. Uh, so 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 there's all sorts of fault lines uh, around this particular topic. Um, the IGP position on it has been clear since day one, um, and and we've published on it as well in in our vaccine position paper. Um, we believe the vaccines is a good thing. We believe it's a way out of the pandemic. I've had mine and we're currently working on a video to to uh, to to reflect the views of our health committee uh, where they're all behind the vaccines. So positive encouragement, if you like. Uh, we've also been very clear that we believe in fair and equitable distribution of vaccines across the globe. And, and we've been clear that um, the oil and gas industry probably shouldn't be number one in line for vaccines because typically our population is healthy and and and, and relatively young. Yeah. So 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 those are uh, th th those are a couple of positions. The, the third position is one around individual choice, which we also need to honour. But of course, last. Uh, we also have to operate within the country that we are and the, the authorities in, in, in the respective countries do set direction for that country. Yeah, and, and we have to adhere to that. So, so it's a dilemma. It's, it's not an easy one. Uh, our approach is one of positive encouragement and at the same time, individual choice. Now, how it's going to pan out over the next three to six months uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's really anybody's guess, um, but uh, yeah, difficult question. And, and, and I understand if, if there are companies who are trying to force this, um, yeah, I can understand resistance to that. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's fine. I mean, it's, it's of course, you know, the, the, this, the point was there, you know, on, on the us versus we that, that it was uh, very, uh, very well alighted. And there is another um, question just came through, Olaf, and it was, uh, and I want to connect with that because it's asking directly to you uh, about uh, good, uh, good comments in your presentation. If you experience resistant uh, to this, uh, let's say, approach uh, to the way we really, we have this promotion of, of cultural impact, but in general, do you see uh, you know, any resistance in moving from the point A to the point B in, in among, you know, the IUGP members? Uh, ab absolutely no. There, there is no resistance, but sometimes there's a lack of coordination and, and sometimes there's a lack of standardization. In, in our workforces, we have lots of people who move between different companies, between different installations, and their reality is that they come to a different culture every time. Uh, and what we'd like to do, as, as with many of the tools that we publish, we would like people, our workers, our industry across the world to meet the same standardized approach to safety, to human factors, to human performance. Um, because we will all be better that way and because it cannot be that a worker in, yeah, using my example, Qatar, is safer than a worker in, 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 in Aberdeen or, 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 or in the US. That is not a, a world that I can recognize with, uh, nor want, do I want to recognize with it. So we're looking for a standardized approach. There are no blockers, but there's a lack sometimes of coordination. And, 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 and that's, uh, that's what we're trying to, to fix and address as best we can. We're only one voice, unfortunately. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, there is another question interesting, and uh, I'm taking this very, very quickly. Because it says, this is from Jane Stewart, it says, do the panel see human performance a proactive mechanism to be aspirational with respect to the energy uh, transition, right? And, you know, from, from my view, this is interesting because we, we are talking a lot about the energy transition. So first of the things that I want to say is it's called transition for a reason, right? You know, it's not something happening tomorrow and probably it's not happening right in, uh, in, in a decade as well. It will take several decades really to get the energy transition. And I think human performance as everything we do in, uh, in the oil and gas will not just improving, uh, you know, our safety, uh, side of it, but even the way we perform in general in uh, in this industry, and that is critical, you know, to make sure that we 
improve our efficiency as an oil and gas industry to keep you know going ahead together with transition and being you know at the the important critical part you know of the uh, energy uh, in the future right so i think that's uh, is is a good point and um with that, you know, I for, for as much I'd, uh, you know, I'd love to get let this great conversation going. I'm realizing that two hours have uh, almost passed, so we are just uh, I would say four minutes uh, to to the end. And I like now to thank you all again, uh, speakers and attendees, and invite my co-chair uh, Steve Murphy uh, to close with uh, his thoughts and on of course on the human factor forum but also invite you to the next event steve this is uh, up to you now thank you hello everybody um so first of all i'd like to thank um, a special thanks to olaf scar michael wright and tim rolf for our guest speakers today for what was i think a, a fascinating forum um, also to Lamberto Nano and to uh, to Carolyn Smith, um, whose dedication really drove this event forward. You know, we've we've talked about having this event for quite a while, um, and it was um, delayed somewhat by by COVID, and it's trying to get the the, the right format together for it. So. Um, Great questions as well. We received at the at the end there, and I think there's still a, a couple that you, I feel that we could carry on there. But but looking back over the talk, you know, Olaf talked about uh, high performance teams. Um, I like the idea of uh, of the islands of excellence as well, and that, that kind of reminds me of the the quote that Steve Ray gave at the beginning there. You know, that to to paraphrase it is um, uh, you know that the a, a small team of dedicated individuals. Um, you know, can actually make real change. Um, you know, and that can start off from a, from a small island, or it can be it can be driven from the top. But there's always opportunity wherever people are in an organisation to actually affect real change in that organisation. There was an also another interesting point um, Olaf made uh, about human factors and in investigations, and uh, I don't know how many people were here at, um, at one of the, the forums we had at the Step Change Building a couple of years ago, but there was there was a key phrase there used by um, uh, someone who did investigate, done a lot of work investigating rail incidents, and it was it was a change in thinking really for the investigation team from from what were they thinking as in you know what were the people involved in the incident what were they thinking to, to actually trying to understand how they were thinking you know what what justifications did they come up with for the decisions that they took that led to the incidents and i think that that's a real step change because i think quite often we can be we can be too guilty of you know just looking at the oh god what were they thinking kind of thing a, a approach of of looking at the the investigations um Michael's talk on on management to change I thought was great you know that they, they started off there with I suppose talking about the the corporate memory and uh, that that's something that uh, is affecting us particularly ever since 2014 you know there has been there has been a, a, a lot of experience has has left our industry whether it's uh, you know early retirement or or, or, or downsizing of organizations so that's that's something that I think uh, everybody at attending this talk is is very very aware of and, and all of the struggles that we have to try and keep the corporate memory together and you know the organizational blindness aspect of you know and how this can form a barrier to recognizing our risks and hazards the the, the guidance from that ai document is great and it's it's if anybody hasn't read it I'd, you know please click on the link that's in that will be in the presentation and read it because you know some of the things in there like the tabular risk assessments or the or the transition plans i think you know the the great tools that can be used you know for 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 looking at at your your management to change and, and how you're driving that forward um, Tim's talk, you know, on the, the challenges of COVID in the for the helicopter operator and how lessons learned, uh, you know, can be applied to future operations, I think was fantastic. Um, I think that that was the first 
time really mental health came up in in our talk and the you know I think it's important to recognize that uh, this week actually 10th to the 16th is the mental health awareness week um, if you if you go onto the, the step change website if you if you just do a google search for um, step change in safety mental health it will it will take you through to uh, a landing page and we've got some some great resources there and also some some very very good online training that is um, that you can look at and see, you know, is that suitable for for your organisation? I think that's that's well worth looking at. The the uh, the LOSA tool, the uh, the line operations and safety audit tool, um, a, again a, a great tool, um, and there could possibly be some some lessons for us to to learn as a broader industry, looking at the looking looking at how that tool works and you know how how it works with the people at the coalface. Um, and I suppose lastly, your point there, Tim, about using this as um, using COVID as an opportunity to uh, what we've learned so far to drive forward performance. I think there's there's the unfortunate quote, isn't there? You know, of not letting a, a good crisis go to waste. But I, th I think that's that's one that's very pertinent to us. You know, we we have. We've learned an awful lot as an industry in the last year um, and you know we can apply those lessons and we can we can use them to drive forward our performance um, for the challenges that will undoubtedly face us in a, in the coming years. So so that's my wrap up of the uh, of the, the, the talks that I took. I took something from each one of them and from the questions as well. So lastly, I'd just like to say that uh, step change in safety, you know, we exist to serve the membership. So if anybody, um, any of the guys uh, and girls on the on the call have any any topics that they'd like us to talk about them, please get in touch with us. Any challenges that you feel that you're facing. We have another event, uh, another forum on the, the 10th of August this month. Um, so if uh, our members feel that they have uh, pressing issues, um, you know that they'd like us to talk about then then please get in touch with us um, we'll see how we can integrate them into the plans that we already have so lastly i'd just like to thank all of our speakers again uh to lamberto and carolyn and for for everybody for attending that's it from me